I have a passion for trees and forests. One of the best antidotes to the stress of modern life is to take the dog for a walk in the woods. Trees are amazing things, beautiful and useful, and tremendously beneficial for life on this planet. They also act as natural carbon sinks. Understanding how they grow helps us to figure out what the climate was like in the past and when the last ice age was. In temperate parts of the world, such as Scotland, where I live, we have distinct seasons. Trees are dormant in the winter, but put on new growth in the spring and summer. They slow down in the autumn and are dormant once again when winter sets in. During the spring and early summer, they grow fastest and produce softer, lighter coloured wood with wider cells. Then, in the late summer and into the autumn, or fall as my friends across the Atlantic call it, the growth slows down and produces harder, denser and darker wood with smaller cells. This growth happens all over the tree in what's called the cambium layer between the wood and the bark. When trees grow, they do so from the tips of the branches as well as putting on another layer of wood each year. The trunk, or bole, being the oldest part, is thickest. So when you cut a tree down and look at a cross section of the trunk, you can see these concentric light and dark rings. Each ring corresponds to a particular year. So if we know when a tree was cut down, we can count the rings back and work out how old the tree was when it was felled. The width of the rings is a good indicator of the weather at the location of the tree in question. For example, in times of drought, the tree won't grow much and the ring for that year will be narrower. The scientists who study tree growth rings are called dendrochronologists, which roughly translates as wood counting specialists. Since the middle of the last century, a huge database has been built up, so that the known records of weather patterns have been cross-referenced with the known tree growth ring patterns all over the world. So we know how weather affects the trees, which means that by studying the trees, we can figure out what the weather was doing before accurate meteorological records were kept. By comparing cut sections and core samples from different trees in specific areas, from both living and dead trees, we can extend this record back in time. How far back, you might wonder? Well, the oldest tree I'm aware of is a brittle cone pine from the southwestern United States. It has been measured by counting its annual growth rings to be 5,063 years old. That means it would have been a seedling like this in the year 3051 BC. According to James Usher and Answers in Genesis, the biblical flood started 1,656 years after the alleged creation date of 4,004 BC, giving us the year 2,348 BC. Creation.com places this date at 2,304 BC, 44 years later, but I'll stick with Answers in Genesis and give the Young Earth Creationists the benefit of the doubt. I'm making this video in February 2014, so the flood allegedly happened 4,362 years ago. According to the Young Earth Creationist interpretation of the Bible, the whole planet was flooded which means that we should not find trees anywhere in the world which are more than 4,361 years old. Mangrove trees can survive with their roots in water, but they die if they're submerged completely. No tree could survive for the length of the biblical flood underwater. But we have several bristlecone pines which are older than this. One of them, ironically, has been named Methuselah. So where does this leave us? The idea of a global flood must be wrong. Keep in mind that 4,000 years ago a local flood may well have seemed like a global flood. There are many other tricky things to try to resolve with the Noah's flood story, but the impossibility of trees already several hundred years old surviving such a flood is the focus of this video. So we have living trees which predate Noah's flood. What about even older trees? I already mentioned that the patterns of tree rings from specific areas can be cross-referenced. 
This means that we can examine wood, say, in an old building or temple, and see if the growth ring pattern matches any others in the database. It's a bit like a jigsaw. Dendrochronologists have been able to piece together an unbroken record which goes back approximately 11,000 years. After that, it becomes more fragmented. So we can confidently say that trees were doing their thing 5,000 years before the young Earth creationists believe the universe was created. I submit that either they've misinterpreted the Bible, or the Bible itself is in error. For those who claim that you must believe in the 6,000-year-old universe hypothesis to be a Christian, I encourage you to check out the link in the description, which will take you to a video called It's an Old World After All, made by the Biologos Foundation, a Christian organization which includes many reputable scientists among its members. Dendrochronology is one of several areas of scientific investigation which lead to the conclusion that the universe is far older than people like Ken Ham and Ray Comfort claim it is. Radiometric dating, geology, lake bed sediment layers, ice cores, astrophysics, biology and more all agree on this. There is a concordance of evidence which is represented by all modern reputable encyclopedias which report that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, the solar system and our home planet are 4.6 billion years old, and that life has existed here for about 3.5 billion years. If Ken Ham and the other young Earth creationists are right, then there must be a global scientific conspiracy to suppress the so-called biblical truth. Think about it. Think your doctrine through. I'm an agnostic atheist, which means I don't know if a god created the universe, but I think it's unlikely. If I'm wrong, and a god did start the whole thing off, then any study we humans do into the workings of nature will only increase our understanding of how God goes about the creation process. Nobody knows exactly who wrote most of the Bible. Why place more faith in a book than in the creation itself? Why not use nature to help interpret the book, rather than doing it the other way round?